Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the British School of Rome. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to see everybody here this evening for this lecture by uh, Ail Weitzman. Um, in a moment, uh, Pipo Chara will uh, introduce uh, Ail, but I just wanted to uh, say a few words of introduction and thanks. First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be able to include this lecture in our series on architecture. Uh, architecture is a critically important part of the British School of Rome's intellectual landscape uh, and has been for uh, many, many years. Uh, it is for us a really important way in which we demonstrate the relevance of the work that we do here and architecture sits well between the academic disciplines uh, and humanities that we have from classical uh, period through to the contemporary and also our visual arts activity. This programme, uh, Meeting Architecture, three fragments being curated by Marina Engel and I'd like to offer my thanks to Marina for all the hard work that she has done to bring this programme together. It's one of our most cohesive programmes, I think, bringing uh, a whole range of different viewpoints on the way in which architecture reflects and responds to civil strife and civil conflict and periods of war. That's a very important uh, subject for everybody at the moment from many different uh, uh, aspects. And I'm particularly pleased that Ail Weitzman is with us, not only because of his own outstanding work and contribution to this subject, but also because this represents in part the growing collaboration which we have institutionally with Goldsmiths College London, uh, which uh, will also lead to uh, a summer school in July with students from Goldsmiths at the British School of Rome working on curating, and I hope many other things in the future as well. So I'll take no more time. Uh, I'm very <coughs> glad to be able to uh, pass uh, over to Pippa Chora, who has followed this programme uh, so well and contributed so importantly to what we've done. Pippa, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for coming and being with us again. And passo la parola, Pippa. Grazie. Marina ordered me to be very fast and to speak in English, so I'll do my best. I met Eyal uh, like some 10 years ago when he was with two other friends of mine, Alessandro Petti and Sandy La, working on this incredible project. On, you know, was looking on top of the, of the construction of the wall and what was happening in the, uh, in the Palestinian and Israeli land from an architectural point of view. He then expanded this, this approach, he became an important professor in my university, in, in Goldsmith University in London. He was a professor, he's a honor, sort of honor professor I think, in Princeton. He, he published many books and now, and also he, I have to say, he expanded architecture in a direction that was not existing before, that then took perfectly firm when he invented this idea of forensic architecture. No? So I think from, a, from, from the research, he got to find a real new frame for, for a way to approach architecture theory and the effect that architecture theory can have in the in the research that, in the relationship that the architecture can have to the world. We just we just come back from Venice. I'm of course terribly guilty because I didn't give AL an award. But I'm very I was very happy to see his work in the Biennale. And I think it was a perfect I mean it also makes sense that it was not the only forensic project, no? This was wouldn't be impossible a few years ago, but then in the Padiglione Centrale we had Ayel's work and then we had this other work that was approaching with a similar, like more artistic way that the history of Auschwitz and the role that architecture had in the Auschwitz story. So uh, we, have to, uh, we have to appreciate and to thank Ayel that he opened a completely new field in architecture and I think it fit very well in this approach Alejandro tried to try it and sometimes, somehow succeeded to give to the Biennale to understand which is the contribution that architecture can give, can give today to the many fronts we have, and that's a super front, of course. Uh, in, in many fronts we have to deal today in everyday life and in global life. Uh, Ayel's forensic architecture is a wonderful sample of this, and I think it also brings us to this 
uh, architecture once was the relationship between a person and its world around it. Now it's very often a relationship between uh, us within our space and a global condition and a global uh, geopolitical condition. So we are extremely happy to have him in Rome. We thank him. We, he published many books. The forensic book is extremely clear and I wish every Biennale goer would read it so it would complete his view on his installation. Uh, but, I mean, she's looking at me badly already and <laughs> so <laughs> I thank everybody, I thank expressly Ayel and I think we can, uh, I hope we will have some time to ask him some questions at the end of his presentation and I think it fits wonderfully well in this series that Marina has been organizing for this year at the British School. Grazie. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. So I think um, just to to try and, 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 and have some to think publicly about the, the issue of forensic architecture is to say that in fact our uh, concept of history and that is architectural history are kind of perhaps a combination of architectural history and pathology or being a pathologist of a building is to say that our attempt is to look at the micro details of an incident, untangle its knot, and pull the historical threads outwards. I.e., an analysis of an incident is always an analysis of the world in which it is part, of the world that make such event possible. Right? So this is not a kind of a debate, I'm not entering into a debate between micro-history and the kind of the history of the long durée, but a kind of a history that shifts across scales, that is both molecular and geopolitical. Okay. Uh, in a sense, um, I think that in understanding forensic architecture as a kind of a pathology of a building, it seems that our work offers also the kind of the level of optimism that the pathologist has. In many cases, um, our work begins where it is too late for the people that are concerned. That's the kind of um, pathologist uh, hope, if you like, or unhope. But often our work is an engagement not only with a question, with the classical question of forensics, what has taken place, but with the mechanism of denial, of secrecy, of negation, uh, that come to enable these kind of events. Because the nature of violence, state violence, that we are dealing with, and forensic architecture is exclusively what we call a counter-forensic agency. That is, we're not doing the work of the police, we will never collaborate with states, not only with the Israeli state, um, the, this is obvious that this is where my work has begun, but we do not collaborate with state institutions in our analysis. Um, for us, the forensic work is a work of uh, it's a civil gaze, it's an inversion of the forensic gaze, it's, a, it's the uh, civilians or uh, citizens looking at the crimes uh, of the state. Um, so, in doing that, you engage a kind of violence that is always entangled. It, it is always a violence against people and things, and it is also a violence against the evidence that violence has taken place. And these are not two aspects, but it's an entangled logic of state violence in the contemporary period, whereas still in the 19th century, States could perpetrate, uh, imperial and colonial regimes could uh, make the violation, boast about them publicly. Today, the international landscape is a bit more complex than that. You need to uh, perpetrate and hide what it is that you do. And negation is negation, justification, and all those other. Um, supplements, let's say, to violence become extremely important because they are the condition 
that allow further violence to take place. So negation has got nothing to do with reckoning with past history, with a kind of transitional justice. There is no transitional justice in the place that I come from. It is to do with taking away the possibility for violence to take place in the future. Now, I'd like to start with um, the figure that most uh, often is associated with this title of only the criminal can solve the crime. This is really how I started to be interested in forensic architecture, and I'll start with a rather strong critique of uh, that practice. Uh, Mark Alasco uh, was, uh, in fact, uh, a CIA agent um, working uh, throughout the late 90s and early 2000s uh, for the CIA in allowing them to bomb buildings. That is, he was what was called uh, in charge of um, high-value targets. And high-value targets are always people. And during the Iraq invasion, during the American invasion of Iraq, his task was very precise. He was asked to trace the 12 top Ba'ath party leaders in Iraq and, in fact, design the bombing that would kill them. However, because the American army at the time was regulated by lawyers, military lawyers, uh, they were bound by a principle called proportionality. That is, how many civilians should die for one you know, aim, the target of the, of the operation. And the number that he was given by Rumsfeld at the time was 29. That is, um, Galasco was allowed to kill up to 29 civilians in every strike, whereas only the 30th civilian would become illegal. Right? So 29 to 30 became the threshold between sacrifice and murder. Now, Galasco did it. He was, uh, in fact, quite good in what he has done in none of the dozens of bombings that he is authorized within densely populated urban areas in Baghdad, mainly, he never killed more than 29 civilians. He kept to that threshold. He never killed any of the Ba'ath leaders either, but that's another uh, story. Coming after the war, um, and feeling perhaps some remorse, uh, I'm not sure, in interviews that I had with him, uh, he was defending his practice, in fact, uh, he left the, um, the CIA and joined an organization called Human Rights Watch, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, American human rights organization. And there, he was doing the same calculation. Were there too many civilians that died in any bombing, whether it is in Russian bombings in Georgia at the time, etc.? He was very good at his profession because he came from it. He was simply running backwards, running backwards what he did forward. So when you need to have a threshold number, 29 civilian dead, um, your problem is not only military, right? If the problem would be simply to kill a person we know he's or she's in a building, you could drop a two-ton bomb. You can, you know, the building is down. And everyone that is there, Allah But if you need to keep a threshold between sacrifice and murder, your problem becomes a design problem, i.e. you are needing to destroy only parts of buildings. Several stories here, a room there, a wing of a building, i.e. you become the designer of ruins. From the designer being the designer of ruins, when he joined Human Rights Watch, this is how his work in Gaza, after the Israeli attack of 2008-2009, he has given, uh, at the time, Goldstone, uh, in the UN investigation, the most precise reading of architecture anyone has given. He went to ruin by ruin and reconstructed backwards the way it was done. So the foundation of forensic architecture, in that sense, is with murder. 
and the success of him was uh, the ability of a criminal to think like a detective, if you like. So it has a kind of a noir element to it uh, already. Now the problem was not that. Everybody accepted and liked him and appreciated his design in that, or his, his human rights report in that sense. Only that when you go against Israel, you face a very, very uh, fierce and committed uh, band of supporters uh, on all levels, on the level of law, on the level of public discourse. And they have discovered, looking through his history, they have discovered that the same man, Marco Lasco, also had a hobby. And his hobby was to collect Nazi fetish items. Now, I don't, it's not exactly my taste, uh, it's understandable. Uh, that, I mean, many people are uh, somehow uh, fascinated by boots and daggers and the leather and all that. Uh, and he was one of them. Uh, of course, what, uh, what has taken place was that when that was published, he had to resign, right? Being participating in targeted assassination in Iraq was acceptable. Uh, but his hobby of collection was not. And this is when our stories uh, combined, because then Galasco uh, asked me, and of course it would be natural for him to defend him on that issue. And I said, uh, not only do we need to accept his forensics um, despite uh, the fact of his hobby, but in fact, uh, we can, in forensics, there is something of the fetish. There's always something of the fetish in forensics. There's always a kind of an obsession with an object and an unpacking through the object of the realities, of histories, of discursive and political networks in which that object uh, is embedded. And if you look at these uh, images, and you would see now throughout the lecture, look, look at the, I mean, in forensics there's always, that is the, the, the most common gesture, an image or an object and a hand, a hand that animates it, that tells a story from it. The rhetorical gesture is always a combination of the image and the expert, somehow entangled. But the image and the expert, he become much more complicated because now we look at the history of the expert, at the hobbies of the expert, perhaps at their fetish or sexual desires in that respect. Um, here is an example. You see Galasco taking very common human right image. Uh, almost every human right people take this kind of photographs. People sitting, this woman sitting very steadfast in front of the ruin of her home in Gaza. Uh, but when he comes to narrate it, he doesn't even speak about her. Not only does he not speak about her, he's looking at the background. Um, and I don't mention this hand motion uh, that might connect to his hobby, but uh, this may be incidental. So that brings us to <coughs> Auschwitz. And Pepe mentioned that, and I'm, I'm, I'm very... Uh, grateful for that because something of the history uh, of that place becomes a kind of a hinge through which we think both testimony uh, and evidence. Uh, in fact, the other, the other uh, work uh, that was mentioned at the Biennale was a kind of a, uh, evidence that were presented during the Irving trial in London in the year 2000. So, in the very first days of January 2000, i.e. the very beginning of the 21st century, a very bizarre legal case unfolded in the Old Bailey. And that was to do with uh, a Holocaust denial, a rather vile character uh, that continued uh, the work of uh, other vile Holocaust deniers like Robert Forisson, his name was David Irving, uh, sued the publisher for saying that he is a Holocaust denier. So he said, in, in fact, in order to prove that I'm not a Holocaust denier, I will drag 
the entire reality of the Holocaust into court in Britain and show that there was a Holocaust, therefore I'm not a denier. Right? At the center of the trial was that ruin. This ruin is uh, almost the only remnant left of uh, perhaps the deadliest place on earth. In this 200 square meter of crematorium 2 in Auschwitz, uh, historians say that more than half a million people lost their lives within that building. So every element in this building was analyzed and turned and the doors, the handles. But there was one particular architectural detail that kept on returning. And this was um, the reality of four small holes that were supposed to be in the roof slab, in a concrete roof slab of that building, from which uh, the Nazi SS perpetrators would pour cyanide in packs called Cyclone B into a room underneath that was full of people. Now the problem is that in a state of the ruin, after about 60 years, you cannot see those holes anymore. Right? Uh, the archaeology and archaeologists have never found until that point, at that point, the location of those four holes. And uh, Irving uh, was promoting that case, saying, no holes, no holocaust. There were no holes. You could have not in entered the poison inside. If the poison could not have entered inside, that building was not a gas chamber, an execution chamber. It was simply a morgue. Uh, if, that was, if that was not an execution chamber, Auschwitz was just a work camp, not a death camp. Without Auschwitz, you don't have the Holocaust. I, he tried to connect a single architectural element, not only to the entire history, but to an entire scaffold that was built around it. The UN, human rights regime, the Geneva Conventions, we all try to debunk by taking away those holes from history. Now that's a very myopic, right? It's a very linear logic. Um, and therefore, an enormous kind of attempt was there to show, this is one, another Holocaust denier who is entering into one of the fracture in the roof to show that it's too big to be uh, the hole. But I find in that uh, gesture, Exactly everything that kind of is around architecture, the ruin, and denial. Now, Harun Faroqi told, uh, told the story, the late great German filmmaker uh, told the story um, about, um, it's kind of a prequel to the Irving trial. And uh, he says, or he tells the story that back in the end of the 70s, in the 1880 he makes the film, the end of the 70s, when Forisson began to deny the Holocaust, two CIA agents in the uh, archive, the photographic archive uh, of the CIA, took out old photographs. And those old photographs were taking, these were reconnaissance aerial photographs, <laughs> They were taking something very different, a factory, a Buna factory, a rubber factory, it was next to Auschwitz, and somewhere at the edge of the barrel distortion in the angle, they have caught that very roof that I showed you before in a state of ruin. And uh, they marked, on the roof they see four stains, and they call it vents. I mean, these are the famous holes. That should be exclusive. Only that the trial now had to go down to the molecular level of the film. Now, both Irving and Van Pelt, Robert Jan Van Pelt, who was the architectural witness confronting him in court, uh, noticed the same phenomena. That as you go deep into satellite, or sorry, into aerial imagery, to analog aerial imagery, the single silver salt grains, this is what a photograph is made of, start getting a kind of a moire effect. This is something that happens on the molecular level of the film. 
And in particular, it happens when the size of the silver salt grain, right, this sort of molecule, molecule that makes uh, the, the photograph, is as big as the object it comes to represent. In this case, what you see here is a group of people marching to the crematorium. But when you, when you enlarge it, you see that the single silver salt grains start breaking the image into a kind of a pattern. But that condition where the single silver salt grain is exactly as large as the object it seeks to represent is referred to in forensic term as the threshold of detectability. So before the threshold of detectability, I see an image of you. I can identify you. Under it, I can see nothing. At the threshold, something very important happened. You need to analyze two kind of topographies as if they were material realities. You need to look at the topography of silver salt, the microscopic topography of silver salt on celluloid. And you need to look at the surface of the Earth simultaneously. And you need to translate between them. That translation, I will show you at the end of this talk, is called ground truth. Ground truth is what links the ground and the image. Okay? So this phenomena uh, is repeated. Uh, in fact, what they had to do was to send that uh, film to NASA uh, image processing agent, uh, a laboratory, <coughs> look at it on the molecular level and confirm uh, that, that, these, that these molecules were in fact representing the holes. Now, I don't want to go deeper into that. I've written more about that trial, and uh, I'll discuss it in my forthcoming book. But just to note that concept, the threshold of detectability, on the one hand, two, the function of denial, and three, the relationship between a single object and the history of which it is part. It could be a false relation, as we've seen here. So, that is that kind of thing. Now, you know, I, I, I was writing about that as I'm writing about the materiality of photography. And back in 2012, I've started, I was commissioned, in fact, uh, by the UN um, to undertake a study of drone strikes. Uh, the reason was that uh, we've noticed, or the UN has noticed, that for a certain period, roughly around halfway through the 10-year drone campaign, drone campaign is roughly 2004 to 2014, right? During this 10 years, halfway through it, around 2009, a certain shift has occurred. And rather than drones targeting cars, <coughs> targeting camps, Taliban camps, they started to target buildings. And the evidence looked like that. A hole in a ceiling was the evidence that a drone strike has taken place. Now, I do not want to compare the Holocaust with its genocide, race, racially bound genocide, <coughs> to this campaign. Um, though the forensic signature was similar. In order to say that the room underneath a ceiling was a site of murder, you needed to trace a small hole in the ceiling. Sometimes not so small. These images are from Gaza. These are bombs that enter into people's homes. They do not blow on top. They enter into people's home and kill people uh, inside. Uh, but how, how did that happen? How come we see, rather than, um, of course, we still see piles of rubble, etc. But what is this kind of little holes that we kept on seeing continuously? Sometimes very small. That's Betlehia, in northern Gaza. You see, this is underneath the same ceiling. Sometimes that same 
missile would go through two layers of walls and would blow up as it has here um, in a bed here uh, killing a child. What is happening is that a new kind of munition started to be developed. And this is a munition that was, by all means, architectural. What does it mean? It means that in order to chase, to, to bring a bomb into a specific room, every missile had, had to be equipped with a delayed fuse. So the microsecond delay between impact and detonation allows the missile to be programmed every time anew in order to go through three or four or two or one layers of ceilings and blast inside. But another thing about those missiles is that when one looks at them, at satellite imagery, and in fact, so much human right work is done through satellite imagery, one can see nothing because the size of a single pixel is kept to be the size of a person from above. I, the, the missile hole is at the threshold of detectability. Now not of an analog silver salt image, but of a digital one. Why is 50 centimeter the threshold of detectability? For privacy reasons. Satellite images scan the planet continuously. They, take, they would have taken picture of millions of people every time they rotate around the Earth. So the, uh, here the American Remote Sensing Act has reduced it. Legally, they can see much more to half a meter a pixel to stamp people out of buildings. But that means also that the hole is always under and within a pixel. Which one of these pixels has the hole, we do not know. By the way, the only exception to the 50 meter pixel law is in Israel-Palestine, where Israeli pressure with the American Congress reduced the size of the pixel, not to the size of a human being, but to the size of a car, that is, two and a half meter pixel. Now, you see there is geopolitics to pixels. There is uh, uh, Turkey, after the flotilla incident, has sent a satellite into space precisely in order to break the two, the two and a half meter limit on Israeli pixel or Israeli controlled American pixelation, if you like. So, if before and after is the very embodiment of forensic time, the way in which so much uh, analysis on environmental destruction and on the war destruction is taking place, we know that in this girls' school in Miran Shah, Pakistan, uh, was struck. We know that uh, civilians died in there, uh, but we can see no difference before and after the strike. The evidence simply disappears within the pixel. So, you have to develop other techniques, and, and really I want to show uh, that one uh, because it is something that, I, uh, that was installed in Venice and I want to kind of take more time to explain what some of you have seen or will see uh, when you go down there. 43 seconds of uh, probably a smartphone recorded footage from Pakistan was smuggled out. It had to pass six hands. Why? Because the area in Pakistan, the federally administered tribal area where drone strike take place, is under siege. And it's not only under siege for people, it's under siege for media. I, you cannot take photographs or cameras or equipment in and out of that area. So when a single video comes out, those 45 seconds are extremely precious. And uh, it was broadcast. Uh, by NBC, and what you see, you see a city, so you see it's not a, what they call a remote tribal area, it's in the heart of a city. You see a building that is destroyed, you see a hole in the ceiling, but 
basically you don't know where it is and what it is that you're looking at. So we have developed, or in fact we spent half a year with those 43 seconds and um, move okay. and the first thing that we notice in those images is something that is very important you see that the person that records this video uh, is standing inside a room of a building perhaps a building site uh, he's looking out of a frameless window onto the ruin but he's never you see that every, in every frame, you see it here, or here, you have a lot of window. And that is not uh, redundant information. In fact, that you see the window in the frame means to us something very, very important. It means to us that the person is filming from a certain depth inside the room. And one can reconstruct the movement of the videographer in, in a room by looking at the window frame. And that means that that person feels in danger. You do not film something outside of the window a meter and a half inside the room if you don't sense danger. I, it tells us it's dangerous to film there. It tells us that that person is scared of something. We don't know what it is, whether it is uh, in America, another American drone strike, what the CIA called double tap, when they would fire again on the same building, or whether it is from the Taliban themselves, who might be uh, in the town and, and not like to, to, be, to be recorded. But that means that what we are looking at are extremely precious bits of evidence. Um, bits of evidence that somebody uh, has risked their life uh, to capture. And therefore, each one of those frames uh, is incredibly important. So we look, we look at every frame very carefully. Here in the first frame, uh, we start seeing shadows. And the fact that we see those shadows tells us that we're looking towards the north. We're looking from south to north, right? The shadow, the sun is in our back in this part of the world. We also see that we are looking at a building from above. So we're looking from a higher building onto a lower building. We combine all the frames into a panorama and we start, and for the first time, and that is really the first building struck by drone that you have image of, imagine. That campaign was going on for years. The US denies it, they say that it happened, you know, that this is Taliban damage. And so we're looking for that typology. A high building in the south, a lower building in the north, that kind of formation of roads. And we can find one that we think uh, might be uh, our building and start to compare that satellite image in relation to other elements that we see in the image. Here is a kind of a set of fanning beams and you have other elements in it. Uh, skip a little bit, but of course we don't know in which one of those pixels is that hole, right? We are at the threshold of detectability. The kind of the politics that I said to you or what happens with the silver salt grain when they capture one head, one person from above, is exactly what is happening to, or is analogous to what is happening to that film, only the geopolitical calculation have created that pixelation, whereas the other one is basically a chemical process. So here we have, uh, basically what we do is create a, uh, a model, uh, Samir Hab, one of our uh, forensic architects, has made this model, and uh, you can see it before and after and we run shadows on it in order to match and understand exactly so we know where it is. Now we need to know when it happened and by matching the sun position uh, on the image, here we have those shadows that I showed you before. 
and by matching the sun positions, uh, we can we can know where we are. So uh, let's continue. Sorry, I don't know this again. Something happened here to my slides. Okay. Now, now we are looking inside the room, and we see that inside. The people photographing feel a bit more safe. So you can start seeing figures, you can start seeing hands. There's a bit of a rocket, which we try to identify and ask, which rocket are we looking at? Because we're looking at a new kind of munition. It becomes very important to identify that munition that allows strikes on cities. But we notice also something else in the image. We notice a certain chipping on the wall behind that uh, hand that is photographing. And we figure out that these are the consequence of the blast in the room. So what we do very patiently is to locate every bit of shrapnel uh, on the room, one by one, uh, each one of those. And uh, the hole in the ceiling that I said is the signature of drone strikes. And then you see on the right an area where the, the, the fragmentation is less dense. And we think that, or we ask ourselves, why is it less dense? It is because somebody absor something absorbed those shrapnels. Now, if there were people in the room, uh, in fact, their bodies, bodies, were photographed onto the wall. So we have here another, another kind of slippage or, or, or relation between material and photographic process. The room, the internal walls in that room are like a photographic film that is exposed to the blast, like a film is exposed to light, right? And you have a certain moment where again, pathology and architectural research are combined together. Oh, again, I don't know. Okay, so this is some form of technical uh, analysis of um, that allowed us to reconstruct not only not only the the places now. You see, from a video that is completely blurred, that is presented in the TV um, without any, almost without any commentary, we managed to see where it is, when it is. Uh, how, where did the people die? How many? And uh, here, try to expose uh, what was the CIA's kind of uh, introduced, newly introduced munition uh, into the war. And uh, here, as you see, the kind of the delayed fuse process. Um, so, you know, sometimes, so this is something that really we've done for the Venice Biennale, because when we got the, the invitation, uh, we did not want to create an installation that simply represents what we did, but we wanted to use the installation in order to uh, create a kind of a laboratory room, to build a one-to-one -one of that room, in order to figure out what was that missile. And uh, what we've done is, is to actually tie with strings, uh, like blood splatter analysis. Uh, here, this is Samani Morphy, one of our one of our team, we actually build a one-to-one -one room, uh, this is in Giardini now, uh, where we could tie a rope and figure out what, where was the blast taking place, and from that speculate that what we're looking at is a munition called Hellfire Romeo, I mean, kind of an incredible name for such a cruel uh, munition. Um, a, a strike, a missile, that one could say, what are architects dealing with the minute fuses of bombs? But the introduction of that missile is the most uh, kind of decisive element in the life of the cities, the three great cities of South Waziristan, Miransha, Mirali, and Datakhel. The three, three of those cities are under a uh, under attack by these munitions, whereas before they were invented, the CIA was holding back from cities. I.e., that delayed fuse, that small thing, allowed for that pattern to be um, 
proliferated. Sometimes the lesser evil, and this is a, a, a little book that uh, was published here with Not a Tempo uh, several years ago, when I already started unpacking the theological and the political meaning of the uh, Male Minore. And um, it's a, always a paradox with it. You think you're doing something more precise, something that reduces casualties, but that allows violence and the government that comes with it to be applied in a much more um, a, in a much more uh, prolific way. I'm going to show this case only very briefly. That's the second case we showed in Venice. Um, and really not talk about the narrative uh, of it, but really only about techniques. Um, this case uh, saw forensic architecture, in fact, being commissioned to be in the place of that guy that was fired from Human Rights Watch after 20, 2008, right? So you remember that guy, only the criminal can solve the crime. You write a book, you criticize that guy, and the next tragedy that happened in Gaza uh, was, in fact, the, the analysis was commissioned to us uh, in collaboration with Al Mezan in Gaza and Amnesty International in, in London. Uh, we wanted to enter into the Strip, uh, but Israel, much like in Waziristan, it's the same kind of technique. You create a siege, and within that, um, you can introduce violence that would later be either denied or justified or distorted. And uh, to break that uh, denial, one has to work with a very different set of materials. Rather than working from material, rather than working like archaeologists, what, what started is a kind of a common project uh, that uh, used, in fact, what Palestinian civilians uh, recorded during that war. And, and, and in that war, was very different than the 2008-2009. The kind of penetration of smartphones, of internet, into the Strip was meant that the most important evidence uh, of this war was produced by people that were under uh, violence themselves. And despite the enormous risks of doing that, because the Israeli open fire instructions are to shoot to kill anyone pointing a camera at soldiers during an operation. So if you do that, instead of running away, you do it because you believe somebody's going to look at it. You do it, you send a message in a bottle, and you don't know who would look at it, you don't know what will be done with it, but, but there's a certain kind of a, a call, a cry, if you like, uh, that comes with it. Now, a lot of those images have water stamps, watermarks of, um, of news agencies, uh, but, but of course the news agencies themselves were not there uh, in Gaza and were buying or simply taking that stuff from the internet and broadcasting that uh, online. So the idea is when you, uh, we were asked to, to look at one single day, August 1st, 2014, uh, the deadliest day uh, in the Gaza war, and reconstruct it from those images from the images were posted during those days. So we went to um, social media and, and pick up those elements. But to look at social media elements is not a passive thing. You cannot just... Looking in general is about construction. Reading is hard. Uh, you know, reading anything, reading, reading literature, reading philosophy uh, is hard. Reading images is perhaps uh, when, when you have so many sources, um, requires construction, it requires architecture. Many of the images that were taken during that day were of bomb clouds, because that is the kind of mega object that was in the air uh, above Palestinian cities uh, of the Strip, uh, that, that, that kind of drew almost the cameras to it. Always the camera is tilted, there's more sky than earth, you know, if there would be no cloud, it would be lower. So it's a kind of a different framing of that. And again and again, uh, we were seeing those images. 
And uh, we're talking about 700 clips and 7,000 images altogether, and each one had to be located uh, and timed in there. And this is how you kind of you start uh, working very, very carefully, very slow reading of the image uh, to understand where it was taken uh, from. Uh, sorry about that. Logos, this is just coming from the report. Uh, this is a film uh, that was taken by the resistance and it is uh, a bombing of uh, the Tanu neighborhood in uh, Rafa. And you see that the videographer, a second before shutting off the camera, um, zooms out and there's two shadow lines. And effectively, I showed you before how we are able to reconstruct uh, the time from the shadow. In fact, for us, the entire city, which we've built uh, based on crowd crowdsourcing techniques, there is a, an initiative uh, of um, open street view where activists in, in Gaza and outside uh, are basically building the plans, creating a digital plan together. Um, and that is, uh, we've given it a kind of a three-dimensional reality. And, uh, you know, this, this information is otherwise only the uh, domain of the perpetrators, of the Israelis that have all these maps. Uh, but sometimes even the municipalities themselves do not have it. Here is a kind of a two-point perspective technique, kind of a renaissance technique to uh, reconstruct uh, a plan from an image and again uh, verify uh, the location of uh, the shadows and, and the time. Um, but the problem was that in, in images like that, where the shadow lines were much further away. And as the day, as August 1st, tilted more towards midday, the shadow got too short. Uh, also, the orientation of the photographers filming mainly from the center of the city towards the periphery where the violence took place meant that a lot of the shadows were hidden and it became impossible for us to time and locate those images until we realized that, in fact, we were looking at the wrong part of the image, that it's the clouds that are, uh, in fact, the physical clocks that would allow us to sync and time uh, what has happened there. And we were really taking a lot of time to think about clouds as architecture, in fact, is architecture in gas form. A cloud is everything that the building was. A cloud is made of concrete and plaster and wood and furniture and plastic and glass and cloth and medicine and ceramics and ink and paper and the human bodies that are in that building all mixed up together high up in the air for about eight minutes constantly shifting, always transforming until they're falling down. In fact, a cloud is a kind of a horrific architecture uh, of mutation. It, in fact, it is it, its mutations that allows it, um, the fact it can never be fixed, that allowed it to be the physical clocks uh, that we were looking for. So we created a kind of an equivalent of the 19th century British cloud atlas. Uh, you know, there's many British kind of uh, quasi-scientists uh, in the 19th century started Goethe also collecting cloud atlases, trying to classify clouds. We were doing that to bomb clouds, giving them each a name, a catalog number, and looking for those very clouds in other places. So look at those buildings above the city, this kind of demonic buildings, um, 100 meter high above the city that are the tragic consequences of what is happening underneath. Uh, during that day, 126 people uh, died. 
so the idea was really to look and try to compare those clouds. These, are, these were very useful bits of evidence because we collaborated with the health ministry uh, in Gaza. Uh, now it is uh, under Hamas, uh, which has actually given us uh, all the footage of ambulances as the ambulances were driving, because uh, Israel has interrupted all cellular communication. Ambulance drivers were driving straight into the smoke plumes. They always had a smartphone or a camera on the dashboard of the car, or if it was a tuk-tuk. This is a tuk-tuk. Always very bravely driving directly to the... to, to the smoke clouds. And, um, and then you, you can start looking and, and identifying the same cloud here, here, and here. But you see that the distance between those two clouds on the left is, is bigger than on the right. And this is because they're looking at different angles. So by conceiving them as three-dimensional realities, uh, one is able to actually um, triangulate and know where the photographs uh, were taken from. So this is another uh, bit of footage uh, in which you see the metadata is wrong. It says midnight, but it's not midnight, obviously. But the gaps between the images are consistent. And you see that the photographer always clicks on the camera when another uh, bomb uh, appears. So this is a kind of a time-space panorama. And what you see here is a satellite image in which we could, we have a, a workable metadata. You can see the cloud here in plan. Uh, and we're looking for the same cloud in elevation from, from the ground able to actually create a sequence um, and create what operates for us like the translation device, like the Rosetta Stone, in which cloud shape against digital time exists and with that we are able to slowly reconstruct uh, the timeline uh, of the attack. And uh, create now, what, what was very interesting for us is, uh, or useful also, is that when Amnesty, an Amnesty researcher managed to, to enter inside, enjoy the Almazan researchers there in, in taking testimonies, that most testimonies uh, of people also were organized around the smoke cloud. So the smoke clouds became some kind of anchor in a multi-perspectival narrative uh, in which, you know, one image shows civilians running away, another uh, tanks moving. Um, you need to locate, imagine, each one of those hundreds of sources uh, within space, knowing uh, where it is. Here you see a photograph taken from the hospital. You see an artillery attack uh, next to the hospital. You turn around, and behind the hospital you have that bomb. The model allows us to locate the, the photograph within it and combine it, combine both material evidence, media, and memory uh, together in a kind of assemblage that is not testimony versus evidence, but a kind of combination of those things. And working meteorologically with, uh, with those shapes allow us to basically locate those images uh, and understand uh, what we call the architectural image complex, that synthesis of memory, matter, and media. Um, what is this one? Okay, in here, oh sorry, I want to show the next one. Um, you can see another element, I, I showed you before uh, that we can, we can identify munition. Here you could see a bomb, there's 25 frames a second. One of those frames has captured a bomb slightly before, it, uh, slightly before impact. Um, we can measure the size uh, of impact and then uh, start to reconstruct, in fact, where we are by putting the photograph inside the model 
and being able to measure that image and with this image knowing how big it is uh, it's 150 meters long and being able to measure the size of the bones so that we can try to understand who is the manufacturer of these so that sometimes legal claims you cannot bring them against Israel you can start chasing its supply chain uh, and by identifying the precise bomb and so you know sometimes all these kind of elements become peripheral perhaps but become very central uh, to what we do so you know I'm cutting a very long lecture short and uh, I think you can testify that it's very long and detailed um, but that is a result of all the triangulation of all the bombs. These are the shadows of the bombs on uh, Rafa on August 1st. I want to end, it's not yet close to the end, but it's the last. <laughs> uh, do you want it to be close to the end? No, 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 I, no, am no, I okay? No, no. Still, uh, I have 20 minutes or so. Um, a case that. Um, case. Again, another tragic uh, political reality that is happening, you know, Israel's violence does not only happen within the occupied territories, in Gaza or in the West Bank, but inside Israel itself, I, in Palestine of 48, a Palestine that was evicted um, and cleansed there. An ongoing demolition of uh, Palestinian homes, and in this case, uh, a photograph by Salama Touri, um, an activist, a uh, land, land right activist in the Nakab or the Negev Desert uh, in the south of the country uh, in a village that was destroyed in fact 100 times. 100 times was destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt. This is a photograph uh, by an American photographer called Fazal Sheikh uh, that shows the result of this, this displacement. So if we think about the Nakba as, a, as an event in the past, as the destruction of Palestine, Palestinian communities, and the ethnic cleansing of that area, um, at least for the Bedouins, but for many other Palestinian communities, this is an ongoing reality. right? the displacement and cleansing of the northern threshold of the desert. Uh, and this village is at the center of it. What, almost the, the, all the elements of the conflicts are, are, are manifested inside this image. What you see here is an old historical cemetery, the Arturi Cemetery. Um, here was uh, the site of the Arturi village about 400 people uh, large um, that was displaced uh, for 100 times. 100 times the Bedouins are exercising their right of return on the ground. They're actually returning. They're returning and they're rebuilding. And it's destroyed. The next day it will be rebuilt again. Um, so here you see forests being planted by the JNF, uh, the Jewish National Fund. Um, there are two forests, in fact. This is the Nuremberg Forest. Uh, it's a Holocaust Memorial Forest donated by Germany uh, that uh, is being built on the ruins of the Alturis lands. And here is the Ambassador Forest. That's a forest uh, in which ambassadors of countries from all over the world, each one planted a tree for the hope and friendship uh, with the state of Israel. Only the South African ambassador refused the honor. Mm -hmm. was smart enough to refuse that. So that is kind of ethnic cleansing through plantation. The Bedouins have retreated into uh, the fenced up area of the cemetery where they hoped the Israelis would not come. Uh, still they did, and they demolished regularly uh, within the cemetery area uh, itself. So the cycles uh, of demolition uh, in the archive of uh, Salam mainly. Here in that area, uh, together with the Al-Rakib Council and Zohot, which is a 
don't know exactly how to define, maybe best the kind of a feminist anti-colonialist group in Israel, uh, we, we set up uh, a truth commission uh, for uh, land rights uh, and the land struggle in, in the, after all trials in the Israeli courts uh, have failed. This is how it looked like here outside of the cemetery. It was called Ground Truth. So I need to explain to you what Ground Truth is. I mentioned before, it's a kind of calibration of satellite with images uh, with the ground. So an archive of old documents and of course the ground truth itself was destroyed uh, after the incidents. Now something that is very unique about the location of al Araki is it exists on one of the most violent borders in the Middle East. And that one of those most violent order, borders is not fenced up or concrete blocks. And I'm not soldier along it, but still it is the most violent border in the Middle East. And it is an environmental border. Uh, it is the line that legally defines the threshold of the desert. After the second, uh, the, sorry, the First World War, when the so-called Orient was captured by the European imperial powers, uh, the problem of what constituted a desert became very acute. And scientists, British, German, French, all argued about how to define that threshold of the desert. Finally, uh, the definition that was most commonly agreed and until today defines desert is an area with less than 200 millimeter rain per year. 201, you're not in a desert. 199 millimeter per year, you're deep within the desert. Not deep, but you're legally within the desert. And the desert, as a definition, is an area within which no private property right could exist. Right? Why? Because 200 millimeter rain per year is the minimum scientists defined, minimum water to raise uh, wheat, or in fact a very special kind of German wheat called Einkorn, which is, I'm not going to take you into that uh, exact definition, but you know, it's an error upon error. Um, so 200 millimeter under it, you cannot cultivate, meaning you're a nomad and nomads have no property right. Now the Bedouins in the Negev, in the Galilee, in other places in Palestine have stopped being nomads since the 19th century. Uh, patterns of migration are extremely small. They would move up the hill and down the hill, up in the summer, down perhaps in the, in the winter, if at all. But that line, the 200 millimeter line, became a knife. Underneath it, there is no property right. Underneath it, you're simply at the mercy of the state. So here, or here you see how the threshold of the desert was already uh, a kind of a colonial frontier, in fact, um, in which it is also the edge of the law. It's the edge of sovereignty. It's the edge of property. The problem is, that the line of the desert, unlike other man-made borders, is continuously shifting. It's moving up and it's moving down. And with it, supposedly, the law should move up and down. But the law doesn't. The desert does. So here, here you see, well, we're in Italy, so I thought to, to include that image of uh, Italian colonial architecture in Libya. Uh, I think it must be very familiar to both of you, to, to all of you here, both no, a few more. Um, but in fact, uh, it, it's a strange historical coincidence that the Zionist project until the 30s was extremely influenced by the Italian colonial project in Libya. It's a direct relation. In fact, Ben Gurion is kind of signed on this making the desert bloom uh, slogan. It's not true. Mussolini has said it uh, perhaps 15 years earlier. 
Uh, you have a generation of, uh, let's say, more right-wing uh, Zionist, early Zionist, pre-state Zionist, uh, writing openly about the admiration of Mussolini with the inconvenience uh, of uh, their uh, Jewish politics that, in fact, was not so explicit at the beginning. And in particular in Libya, uh, under Balbo, was not uh, uh, as strongly enforced uh, as in Italy. But here is the threshold of the Sahara Desert. The Italian colonial project in Libya was to push the Sahara south, and it succeeded about two dozen kilometers to the south, uh, always to do with a destruction of communities, with a genocide of the Syrian Bedouins uh, that was poisoned with gas, put in concentration camp, uh, and uh, expelled in order to allow that expansion of the desert. And that line, that line of the desert, that threshold between desert and no desert, that goes through North Africa, cuts Morocco and Algeria and Libya, continues to Egypt, <coughs> enters Palestine and Gaza, just north of Rafa, where we showed the, the previous uh, investigation, goes through the northern Nakab, then goes up to Hebron, goes all the way along the eastern slope of the Judea mountains, cross to uh, uh, Jordan, then goes to Dara, where the Syrian civil wars began, Damascus, Homs, Araka, all the entire arch of trouble in the Middle East exists on the low, on the ebb and flow lines of uh, what I call the conflict shoreline, where uh, settlers and displaced Bedouins by forests. Here you see that kind of forest, it's very interesting. If you notice this, this part here, this you can identify Bedouin archaeology that the forest is actually built on top in order to erase. And I found that building in an old British uh, aerial photo photograph from 1945. So here, if you look at the threshold of the desert as scientifically defined by imperial and colonial powers, I noticed an extraordinary co coincidence. Because I've done for the UN the drone analysis, I did an experiment. I took all the places where I had data about drone strikes, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, Mali, uh, etc., and I placed it on this meteorological map. I wanted to understand the relationship between rain and drone strike. In fact, all drone strikes in the world are happening on or close to the 200 millimeter rain per year. And this is not because the drones are trying to stop desertification. Uh, in fact, resistance to imperial power always retreated to the desert. That was the extra the great extraterritorial zone. Um, it is, in fact, since the, the, uh, the beginning of the airplane that the history of the desert and the history of bombing from the air were entangled together. Uh, a good Italian example is, again, uh, Balbo himself was a pilot or the head of the, uh, whatever could be called, of the Italian Air Force at the time, and his way of dealing with Rebellion is not by the police, is by bombing them from above. Churchill did the same in Mesopotamia. In fact, these very same places where drones are operating right now are the places where uh, the colonial air forces were operating uh, in the past. Here, another example from Italy, uh, kind of a selfie of a pilot, if you like. And you see today the same kind of plane here spreading uh, herbicides, chemical that destroy fields, poisoning the fields of uh, Bedouin communities, not making the desert green, but making the green into desert. Here you see uh, a collaboration that we've done, uh, in fact, with NASA. Uh, we've asked for a vegetation photograph from satellite 
What you see here in green is not green, it is just a very robust photosynthesis of plants, where you see uh, yellow and orange, uh, the level of carbon sequestration and photosynthesis drops. And you start seeing a kind of an archaeology that is manifested through plants. So first of all, you would ask, or everybody almost asks, what is this straight line? How can it be a straight line uh, in vegetation? <coughs> in fact, that's the border to Egypt. So uh, here is the area controlled by Israel, from which they have expelled the Bedouin uh, pastoral, pastoralists. So there are no goats there. This is a picture of ethnic cleansing. There's no goats. They do not eat the grass. There is more grass. The, the, the NASA satellite image gives us yellow. On the other side, Bedouins are free to roam and uh, the grass is eaten. Uh, you can see here the borders of Gaza and the, and, and the direct kind of sharp fall of uh, vegetation. And you can also see how the displacement of the Bedouins from here to here was not only a displacement from territory, but a displacement, a meteorological displacement, into the desert, deeper into the desert. So here you see the kind of, only from the aerial perspective, and this is a photograph taken by kites. I'll show you in a second how we do that. Um, you can see the traces of the bulldozer that goes back and forth and back and forth, and as you erase that uh, community. You can also see here, uh, in this erased community, uh, something rather incredible. These are called sires. These are livestock uh, pens. Uh, you have goats there, and the bodily fluid of the goats soil the ground. When you are removed and return, you might build another. No, so this is the freshest one. This is one year old. These are two year old, three, four, etc. You see on the ground the generation of displacement and return, displacement and return. Uh, you can see it here clear. This is an area that is next to a place that is rumored to have Israel nuclear. Uh, reactor. Israel does not recognize it as a reactor, but still it, it provides pills, anti-radiation pills for anyone around it, uh, and does not allow uh, Bedouins to settle. So the Bedouins would go, settle there, will be removed and returned, will be removed and returned. In fact, the surface of the earth is like a photograph. You see that issue returns again and again. I started with a, the room was like a photograph, we needed to look at the photograph as a material reality. Now we look at the surface of the earth as a photographic inscription of politics. One of the things that I had to do in that case was to look at old 19th century uh, texts, Orientalist texts, here by uh, a British man called Palmer, Henry Palmer, uh, total racist, Orientalist, that traveled through uh, the desert at the end of the 19th century, and has seen nobody there. It's seen just a, a, a desolate land, something that uh, was also always used by uh, Israeli, by the Israeli courts to tell the Bedouins, you were not there. Now, this is a, a kind of a known story, only that, in fact, um, in Saeed's great reading of these texts, uh, he's very much concentrated on the kind of uh, critique of their political position from which they wrote on the sort of racist preconceptions, etc. But every text has elements, and one could read it not against the grain, but for the grain. Try to find traces of grain within those, to return back to those texts that we have dismissed and read them very carefully. And here you have, I'm actually going uh, with a book in my hand, doing ground truth to the book, uh, with a book in my hand, finding the, every hill and bend in a, in a stream that was described in it, and, um, and in fact uh, going to trace it. Because rather than uh, describing a desert country, 
I was very interested in what year was it that Palmer did his trips through the desert. And I went to the meteorological record, and it's very scant meteorological record of Palestine uh, in the 19th century. You need to get meteorology out of other things, out of non-meteorological data. And the best non-meteorological data is grain price, the price of grain. Uh, during that year that Palmer went through the desert and said it's all desert and I see nothing, I went, I uh, was uh, tenfold, uh, went ten, ten times higher, and there was a ban uh, on export of grain from Beirut. So you could see that actually he was going, he was not seeing a, de a, a desert, he was seeing a, the result of a drought here. And you can start reading um, that you can see that actually he described brown mold beneath her feet was hard with the fiber of dried vegetation and that the hills and plains showed traces of the plow, right? So, I mean, it's not even kind of uh, deeply camouflaged in language, it's just been ignored that in fact you see nobody there but dry fiber beneath the, the, the feet means that in the previous year there was cultivation. And uh, that was very important. It was very important to find that well, to find those places. Uh, this is Nouri Lokubi uh, in an area. Now look at it. This is, I've just taken this photograph uh, in a trip together with Nori there uh, in April, beginning of April. It's lush. It's incredible. That's the area that the Israeli state say is a desert. Nothing could have grown there. Uh, the people there are nomads. And this kind of form of, of wild wheat that is growing there confirm the possibilities of wheat cultivation uh, and in fact small wheat fields uh, that are grown by uh, the Bedouins farmers there and some of the plants <coughs> that are growing indeed, you know, meteorologically perhaps we are south of the of the two hundred millimeter line, but there's certainly a possibility of cultivation. That is an incredible map uh, that I found while doing this analysis. It so happened that in the very same day that the Balfour Declaration uh, was given at the end of twenty seventeen in November. Uh, on this very same day, there was a battle between the Ottomans and the British in, on those very hills. So here, this is the cemetery. This is the British line. This is the Ottoman <coughs> fortification. Uh, it, took, it wasn't a great battle. It was a few sharp exchanges of fire and uh, the Ottomans moved back uh, to another defensive position. Uh, but what I could find uh, was commands given to British uh, soldiers, in fact these are Australian soldiers under British command, that uh, could not read maps. Therefore the British were taking photographs for them and saying you need to you know, attack that hill and you to attack that hill over here, etc. And in order to orient them they always put something, an object, in the foreground of the image. And this object here, uh, most of those objects are wells. This is a water hole. It is this water hole. Right? Something that could be found uh, later. In fact, the inadvertent evidence that is to read military documents against the grain now would make you see things that otherwise uh, could not. Here, look. Look at it, even Google collaborates with the Israeli government. This area is full of communities and settlements, but they're not marked on the map. You don't see them. And because of the resolution that I told you, because the satellite resolution on Israel is lower, uh, even the communities themselves do not have any useful way to operate, to, to hold, to own the space uh, where they are. Look, this is the cemetery. Uh, you don't see any, any of those tents. And this led uh, the Israeli government through one of its uh, organizations to make this map 
uh, of the cemetery area and to claim this, this image is a British aerial image from 1945 to claim that basically the Alturius were not there before the state. It became very important to, to note if they were before the state in 1948, before the state was established, uh, they could somehow uh, claim for ownership. If they came after, this would have said, well, you're squatters, right? It's our. Regardless of the logic of this argument, uh, this was what has been done. So what we've done is to create that situation of ground truth. Uh, this is a mineral bottle uh, cut and there's a camera inside. The camera is held with a rubber and it's put on strobe photography. That means that every 10 seconds it would take one photograph. It is tied to a wire um, and the wire is tied either to a balloon or to a kite. So here you have a kite. You have a kite. Here is the camera. Right? It's, it's dangling underneath. The, the reason, the fact that the kite is always shifting in the air means that it takes the images from various uh, different perspectives. Now that's great fun for kids also to, to work with that. The technique was developed by an American NGO, I think, called Public Lab. Um, and that technique is called community satellites. That's community satellites. <coughs> but what is incredible about this idea is that, um, is that you see the movement of that. You're simultaneous, you take an aerial images while your feet are in the dust. And you simultaneously see the ground and the air. That calibration operates in a very bodily way um, and uh, the movement of the kite uh, <coughs> allow exactly that kind of looking at the, at the, this is not from my laptop, but trying to look at the ground with the old and new aerial images and, and, and combine them. So these are the location of the kite and these are the perspective of the kite. And you see a three-dimensional uh, object, that, and you see the, the difference in resolution that we are able, sorry, to generate. So this is the low-resolution Google collaborationist uh, image, and this is the kite image. And you can start undertaking some ground truth calibration and look at the bulldozer tracks, and very importantly, see this element. I, I'm not sure if you know what it is, but it's the same sira that we've seen before, right? Uh, the same livestock. Here it's actually one goat was tied around that uh, pole, and this is the urine or uh, defecation of it. Uh, these are these elements. And this allows us to actually read now not only British aerial photography, but this is German or Bavarian. This is uh, the Bayerische Flugbataillon 304. It's a, it's, a, it's a unit that was flying for the Ottomans during the war, taking aerial photography of the battlefield. This is, I could not find exactly a shot of, of the cemetery. This is about a kilometer north. And you can start drawing in and seeing almost at the threshold of the image those series are oh, here perhaps a farm I mean, we, we are very much at the molecular level of the film again um, a tent perhaps all those very gentle forms of inhabiting the land that are, I think these are three tents because tents have this orientation, but simply like a darker shade on the image. And this is the British aerial image from the 1st of January 1945. Now you remember I started with a photograph, aerial photograph of Auschwitz. It's taken a few months later, 
a very similar plane on a very similar film. It's taken during the Second World War. And the problem here was identifying again the darker grain. Yeah, the darker grain. This is, uh, this is as big as the hole in the ceiling. This is as big as the hole in the building that we have seen. This is a well that you can find on the ground. The house of the father of uh, Nui. Uh, but of course, the important thing with the graves. And we needed to understand the relation between a pile of stones and sand and the silver salt on the grain. And therefore, to return to the image from the present, to return to the image from the ground, to ground truth it, is to start understanding that what you see here is not simply a kind of a chemical reality on the film. You draw so hard, you see single silver salt grain but they exist in a way that uh, is divided in a very similar way to how the cemetery uh, would be, right? You see an area that is lighter, a, the ground has been walked upon, it's a bounded area, and you see single grains that are as big as a person from above and almost as big as uh, the pile of stone, meter and a half. And it is in this combination between the grain and the geopolitics, between the kind of the micro molecular analysis and the history of the long durée that forensics uh, need to exist and operate. Thank you for listening. cases this could be interesting and how important it could be this idea of using architecture as a mean of understanding, yeah, which I think is important. Uh, it's also nice, I think, to connect uh, the series of lectures we've been here because classically we are, as, as we said, really once we're redefining archaeology somehow, no? because the archaeology of the present is connecting in a very complex and articulated way to the historical idea we have of archaeology. And also, I have in mind other cases in which interesting actors have been working on this idea of shifting borders, which is another extremely interesting field. So I think we just have to thank Ayer for offering us so many possible ways of developing what he's doing. And, and and I don't know if somebody really wants to say something, but on my side, I would just thank him <laughs> very much. Thank you. Thank you. But if somebody really wants to ask a question, we hear. Okay. I have a cigarette can, you, can I ask you one question? Yeah, and absolutely. then you can use thank it you. to post. No, to do the postscriptum. No, one question is this relationship between perfection. No, there is, there is a one, there's some kind of incredibly perfect or accurate technical uh, accuracy in the work you do, especially the first, not the forensic part, uh, the, the bombing and the task. So. How important is this kind of getting so close to an art project, no? to, to the beauty and the, the quality? I mean, this, this, I feel this tension between beauty and, and pain in this work. So how, how important is this the, to create such a perfect development of, of stories? And then the task you have with, you, with the work you do. I'm sorry, it's maybe a 
that no, I think it's a, it's a great it's a great question, and that we pose to ourselves a lot because so often when the heart aches and the blood boils in um, facing violence, um, it's very hard to find eloquence. So you have to find eloquence in face of that which is. Um, which the effect on you is, is, is simply to numb you, to shock you, to, to, to take away your capacity to speak. And um, so you have to always fight something within yourself. There's always the, the material... I, I can tell you that even in years of working on that, you never lose the sense of pain. Um, that these images embody, and if you lose it, you're not a good reader. Uh, you need to connect to it, uh, because that would give um, value to your work. So when somebody risks their lives uh, to take an image, that is the most important act. The least you can do is to read what somebody writes. And to read is complicated. If you want to read, this is what it takes. You, you need to build models, you need to look at history, you need to open the archives. It's not simple looking. Um, it's not a photojournalistic relation to things. It's a deep and painful act of reading. And art and aesthetic practices at their best we tend to be always very cynical about it, but I, I have also great love for for the capacity for, for what artists uh, and art historians and do and to the way that they taught us to look, uh, the way that they train the eye, um, and the way in which aesthetics is all not simply a pleasurable play of form or color, um, but it is the sensible, it is what could be perceived and what could be uh, also comprehended uh, from something. So the very first layer of aesthetics is material aesthetics, is how matter perceives contact, how matter preserves the traits, how photograph or digital image, how the pixel gets darker, or how the single silver soul particle start connecting to others. That's aesthetics. This is the way that that silver soul senses something else next to it. Uh, so, on, at its very best, aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic habits of culture offer for us um, a very careful and uh, tuned sensibility to read. And sometimes there is not much in it, but sometimes the only thing you can do. And this is you need to do well. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie.